Hello, I am Paleo Artist, which means I draw pictures of dinosaurs and things. Just, uh, in my case, just for fun. There's people that do it professionally. That's, um, but what we strive for in Paleo Art is scientific accuracy. And that is something that I have noticed is sorely lacking in a lot of instructional books and instructional videos that you can see on the artistry and science of reconstructing dinosaurs. Now, this is not going to be super rigorous here, so don't worry, but I am going to try to remedy that. Uh, lack of accuracy in paleo art videos right now by teaching how to draw an apatosaurus or brontosaurus. Both names are correct now. They reestablished brontosaurus as a scientific name in 2014. Very exciting study. Um, but the way we start if we're just doing basics is with some standard shapes. So to show where the animal's rib cage will be, we're going to draw just a circle. Behind that is a triangle to represent the hip, the, the pelvis. Now we're going to have a line below that to represent where the ground is. Now in real life the ground is never going to be quite that flat, but it's fine for our purposes because this apatosaurus isn't going to really be doing anything. Um, but this right here represents the bulk of the body of that animal, which really is... Uh, it, just this is roughly the size of an elephant. It's quite impressive. Um, but we're going to connect those, a nice curved line below for the belly, and a straight line above to show where the tops of the spines on top of the, on top of the vertebrae sit. Now, about half the length of a sauropod dinosaur like this sauropod, meaning long neck, is going to be the tail. So just take a line out from the top of the triangle really far. The tail is probably about 35, 40 feet long. It's crazy. Um, then it ends in a whiplash tip. It's most famous in Diplodocus, but it's present in Apatosaurus as well. Uh, so we're going to start thickening it about two-thirds of the way down. Giving us this nice whiplash here, and then the more muscular part here. There will be a little bit of a triangle there, because the hip is actually shaped roughly like this, um, and that part of the hip there will form this point in the living animal. It shouldn't be super pronounced because we don't want anorexic dinosaurs, but it's going to be there. Now, the neck is really long, but not ridiculously long. We're going to have the skull, which looks really tiny, but it's about the same size as a horse's head. Out here, roughly one-third of the body length will be neck. And then going from there to there, it's a very loose S-shaped curve. Apatosaurus is noteworthy for just how massive the neck is. I'm going to be using that word a lot in this video. Um, so we'll take it 
from roughly the chin down like that. If you make the neck too thin, you're turning, in, you're turning it into a diplodocus, which, while diplodocus is a perfectly lovely animal, that's not what we're trying to do today. Um, and then, finally, we're going to be adding in the legs. Now, we see on my little hip right here, right where the three bones connect, that's where the hip socket goes. So for now, we're just going to be doing what's called rods and joints to show where exactly, the, to show roughly where the bones are going to be and then add in the muscles afterwards. Um, it's just going to be sort of mid-stride. So that's the upper leg bone right there. This represents the knee. The foot down here, the ankle, would go right about there. Huge muscles to power this animal. It weighs about 20 tons, between 20 and 30, really. Um, about the weight of four elephants. Okay, retract at the knee, we have sort of a drumstick right there controlling the lower leg that is going to be quite columnar like an elephant's and then we have a line here representing roughly where the top of the hip will be and it's not the same line as the top of the neural spines which come up above Patasaurus is also noteworthy because of these huge claws it has on its hind feet. So, and claws give him a nice fatty pad representing the back of the foot. Then, coming from the same point, there's the second knee and the other foot. right here. No claws visible from this side. Just sort of shading it in right there. Now the shoulder blade is shaped roughly like that. And then we have a second bone that's not present in humans called the coracoid that forms sort of a half-moon shaped shape at the front of the rib cage. You can see coracoids next time you have a roasted chicken for dinner because chickens are dinosaurs just as much, just as, much as this apatosaurus is. But, regardless of that, that's where the upper arm bone, the humerus, begins. I'll take that back take it down the wrist there so that we have this leg off the ground once again very large muscles but in dinosaurs the back legs are almost always much more powerful than the front leg so it doesn't need to be quite as large and there's only one claw contrary to what you see in movies like Jurassic World there's only one claw visible on the front legs. And it's a huge spike that would have been quite a nasty weapon for any meat eater foolish, foolish enough to mess with an animal this big, um, but would also maybe help stabilize the animal if it was to rear up and start eating on a tree. Uh, once again, we start from the same position. We're just going down standard once again add the muscles in and the claw once again held off the ground like so and here's a basic apatosaurus I probably should have taken the neck a slightly higher angle it's correct for that just a bit here 
Now, apatosaurs are interesting because they have these big growths on the bottoms of their uh, neck vertebrae, which may well have supported these keratin lumps that they would use for combat within the species or to defend themselves. We'll represent those like this. It's called in uh, paleoartist circles sometimes Bronto Smash, which I think is a fantastic name. Um, well, the skull, there's not really a ton of room to give a lot of detail to the skull, but it's roughly the same shape as a horse's head. Oh, there we go. The eye sits quite high, actually. The nose may have had... Um, may have had a fleshy tube going down from the forehead to the front of the face, or they may have had their nostrils on the tops of their foreheads. Um, it doesn't matter. There's no scientific consensus on that. Um, possibly be teeth sticking out, but a lot of science now suggests dinosaurs would have had to have lips keeping their teeth moist. Um, so... The, uh, no teeth visible. They may have had little spikes along their backs. Those have been found in Diplodocus, although there's some thought that that may have been a mistake. I'm not sure. I haven't actually read the paper. But you can, uh, give little dragon-esque spikes on the back. Um, this little line suggests the change in depth from the more narrow neck to the really wide rib cage. So does that. And this line here. Um, you should avoid texturing these animals too much because their scales are actually really tiny. Um, And then we just add some shading. We add these uh, lines showing sort of where the muscles attach from the leg bones to the, to the rest of the body. They're sort of flaps of skin you can see actually on elephants today. I'm sort of a similar thing. Um, really huge base of the tail. The muscles at the base of an apatosaurus tail could send the tip flying at close to 200 miles an hour or so and make a really loud cracking noise like a whip or uh, alternatively shatter the head, jaw, body, rib cage, leg of any attacking meat eater, which is going to be roughly one-tenth its size. Um, anyway, just shade a bit. Obviously, in the final product, you're going to want to erase these guidelines that we have. Um, we're going to avoid grass for this animal. Grass hadn't evolved at the time of Apatosaurus, and the ground covering would have been ferns, horsetails, club mosses, things like that. There were a lot of these things that looked like giant pineapples called cicads that I'm adding in here. Um, and all of these things would have been food for Apatosaurus. I have the neck in sort of a natural position for just walking around this um, it wouldn't have craned its neck on a regular basis, but having the neck held in an elevated position actually puts the vertebrae in, uh, it actually lessens the stress on the vertebrae, 
So if you ever hear someone telling you that a patas that sauropods couldn't raise their necks up really high, they are lying to you. Um, but so we we would have the neck in an elevated position is what that means. Um, but they would drop the neck down something like this maybe to feed on uh, ground level plants um, and there you go it's very loose you can do whatever you want with the pose you just follow these guidelines and remember that the uh, the femur is not going to be able to go much past right about here on the animal. Um, and uh, basically, you just follow sort of elephantine mechanics for how you're going to have the animal walking. And there you go. See you next week. Maybe.